This is United States History Chapter 2 on the 13 Colonies, uh, beginning on pages 19 and 20. Let's go ahead and look at the assignments that we'll be doing in this chapter. Again, dates are here. Hopefully we'll follow them, but again, they could change. Uh, both groups, CP and Honors, will do uh, these uh, section review pages, uh, 21, 25, 31, 34, and 36, so you have five of them. Remember, CP, you only do the numbered questions. Honors, you include the starred questions as well. Uh, both groups will be doing uh, student activity page 9. Pay attention to the fact that we're only dealing with questions 1 and 2. Uh, this is really dealing with a map that's going to help us for a uh, first uh, quarter quiz where we will be taking the United States and breaking it up uh, over the course of the year. And so we will deal with the 13 uh, colonies, 13 original states here in quarter number one. Uh, you'll also both groups be doing page 10. Notice all of this is due on Friday the 28th of August and we will quiz chapter 2 on that date, review and plan to test on the following Monday on chapters 1 and 2. And you will want to study diligently on those chapters, reviewing them, because this will be a lengthy uh, test to start the year with. Introduction here, uh, looking at page 20, uh, really kind of switching things around in this chapter, so just kind of keep it in mind. First of all, you do need to know your uh, colonies according to their region. So the New England colonies, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. And again, you're knowing them, being able to list them. In fact, I believe this is one of uh, the things that you would see on a quiz for this particular chapter. Knowing the middle colonies being New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Again, another four. <clears throat> and then the southern colonies being the remaining five, Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. Out of those, Maryland probably the one that doesn't ring a bell with us as being southern, but it was considered a southern colony. So again, you have uh, this particular map that you'll be working on, and this is our key map, especially for knowing uh, your uh, original colonies. Um, eventually, as we move forward through uh, the uh, course of the year. You will keep reviewing these, but you will be asked to know their capitals as well if you are in the honors uh, section. So keep that in mind, honor students. Now, in particular from page 20, looking at uh, the reasons the British came, and these are scattered through the page, dreams of quick riches, men who thought they're going to get off the ship, they're going to walk on land, and they're going to be picking up nuggets of gold. Uh, for some, it was the abundant land. They could not own land in England, so come to the New World and be able to own a piece of property themselves. Uh, political and religious freedom, the fact that they thought a little bit differently than how England itself was operating, especially with your system of nobility and people not being able to get ahead because all the land was already owned. Uh, the religious freedom, not everybody was agreeing with the idea of the Church of England. We'll see that uh, as we move forward. And then adventure. So I'm just thinking this is just going to be fun. They found out pretty quickly uh, that it wasn't going to be quite that way. Now, how might they end up determining how they were going to come on page 21? There was one idea of the joint stock companies. Uh, it was very expensive if someone tried to put up all the money themselves to start a colony because if it failed and it was likely to, then they're going to be out a lot of money. So with the joint stock companies, you had a lot of people investing. They were going to share in the profits without sharing in all the liabilities of this. They're not going to lose everything they have. So this provides a mean whereby enterprises can get large monetary resources and still remain free from that government control that accompany the government-sponsored projects. They were not having to, um, while they were going to honor the king and respect the king and obey the king's laws, they weren't having to be uh, told what to do by the king in every instance. And, and that idea, they had some freedom to begin to think in terms of governing themselves. 
Uh, as you look at these on page 21, King James I, April the 10th of 1606, grants two companies, the London Company and the Plymouth Company, a charter for colonizing what became known as Virginia, after the Virgin Queen. Uh, the London Company will end up establishing Jamestown, which we know of as being the first permanent English settlement in the New World in May of 1607. Uh, many of you, because of where we live here, have probably had the opportunity to visit Jamestown and see it firsthand for yourself as it's been uh, restored as a historical site. Again, you have the idea of the Jamestown Fort here. Uh, again, notice how close they are to the water. We need to be close to the water. We need to be found when they come in. But being in these low-lying swampy areas also subjected them to uh, diseases and difficulties. They thought as well, being near the water, then it made it easier to defend themselves. Uh, and if you've been to Jamestown, then you've seen uh, some of these uh, buildings and, and the ships themselves. Perhaps you've been on them as well to look through them. Imagine traveling in this way to get to the New World. It'd be very, very challenging for you. These people, as they came, were going to face some difficulties at Jamestown. Uh, in those early years. Uh, the first ones are bitter because of malaria, typhoid, fever, dysentery. Uh, as you move over on to page 22, you also see the difficulties with the Indians of the Powhatan Confederacy that complicate the settlers' existence. These are, you know, Native American groups, again, that are not necessarily welcoming to the intrusion that's happening to their land, especially as these settlers are coming in and trying to create farmland and such, and and you know, limiting uh, or keeping them from areas that they considered open to them. So again, difficulties uh, in the way of thinking between the two groups. So how does this then play out? Powhatan is going to order war against the colony. Peace ultimately comes in 1614 when his daughter Pocahontas marries the Englishman John Rolfe, regardless of what Disney has said about Pocahontas and John, Captain John Smith. She marries John Rolfe. She will travel to uh, England. She will take on the mannerisms of the English court, the English dress. Unfortunately, she's also going to uh, die relatively soon because many of these Native Americans simply did not have an immune system that was capable of protecting them from the types of diseases that the Europeans were carrying that didn't end up taking their lives. Uh, so what are the difficulties that are facing them? And these are really page 22, page 23. You've got the difficulty of gold fever. Again, these young men especially coming and thinking that they're going to just get rich quick. And so instead of taking the time to build their, uh, their uh, houses and growing their crops, they're just going out trying to get rich. And these things ne neglected. And when times get tough, then they expect someone else to take care of them. So Captain John Smith then has to enforce the kind of discipline that's necessary uh, to, to make them work. Remember that idea of if you don't work, you don't eat, taken right from Scripture. He's also going to work towards improving the relationships with Powhatan's men, who then turn and taught the settlers how to grow maize and melons, grow something that then they would be able to feed themselves with. Again, here's the principle that Captain John Smith is enforcing from 2 Thessalonians 3.10. If any would not work, neither should he eat. You wouldn't believe it for a day or two, but after a couple of days of not eating, you would do your part, even probably if that meant you were grumbling while you did it. In the winter of 1609-1610, though, uh, the colony suffers its severest trial when 90% of the colony dies uh, because of the severe winter and the lack of preparation that had been made for it. Um, ultimately, they're going to be ready by the spring to pack their bags, and they're ready to you know, head home when new settlers, new ships are going to arrive at that very time, and it's going to keep the Jamestown uh, settlement from just simply shutting down. Now as you look at the southern colonies and you look particularly here at Virginia, 
There were four events in 1619 that helped to establish it. Martial law imposed by earlier governors was lifted. Now this is going to be the kind of thing that encourages more to be there. The House of Burgesses gets its start. Uh, this was their first legislative body in the colonies, uh, in the New World, where they are getting together to govern themselves. Now, even uh, years later, still in their early days, uh, they were dealing with unusual laws. And if you've been to Williamsburg, you perhaps heard some of that, but laws like, are we going to let people's pigs run in the streets uh, freely or not? Okay, another event, Dutch ships brought Africans for slave labor. Um, and we, we start to see that triangular motion of the, of the Dutch ships. They're going to bring in the Africans for slave labor. Eventually, the colonies are going to actually um, reach a point where they no longer are going to let the slaves come in that way, but it doesn't do away with slavery. It simply means they need to, they're going to continue to have slavery, but it's going to be those that are born to slaves in uh, the colonies and ultimately in the United States up until 1865. Uh, and again, this is part of what, you know, we're being reminded of uh, with the different events that are happening now and, and people that are connected to uh, the political leadership, uh, the exploration, all these things, you know, people starting to look at them and say, wait a minute, maybe we don't need to honor them with a statue. So you'll see history books revising somewhat depending on their position on the different topics. Uh, 90 eligible women arrive, and again, this is going to, uh, with the goal, hopefully, that these men are going to obviously uh, marry and settle down and start families. Uh, notice that they are available to be purchased as wives for the cost of their passage. So imagine being a young lady in Europe with uh, no real opportunities. Perhaps you're an orphan, and you're not from a family of nobility and wealth, and so you're looking, how do I take care of myself how and this being what you thought was perhaps your only option I'll go to this new world and someone will pay my passage and I'll become uh, their wife so then we see three types of colonial government that will be used these are over on page 24 there is the charter colony governed by a trade company it's going to receive its authorization from the king. It enjoys the most independence in their government. Again, a company has decided, we're going to put up the money to invest in this. We'll be loyal to you, king, but we get to run things. And, you know, you'll get tax money, whatever, but we're going to uh, be able to gain from the profits of the colony. And, you know, the government doesn't have to take on expense, so they are going to like this idea as long as there's cooperation. The proprietary colony, the king appoints a proprietor who's responsible to the king. So again, a little less freedom on the colony. But you have someone that is responsible. And then ultimately the royal colony controlled directly by the king. The governor is appointed by the king. And so the governor is doing just what the king tells him to do. Now, how do we get people to come? That patroon system that we saw earlier in chapter 1 didn't work. Well, here you have the idea of the head rights. And you kind of have to uh, back up a little bit, I believe. If you're looking in your book, it actually shows up on page 20. It's here in our notes now, so it's fine. But there's 50 acre tracts that are going to be given to those who paid for their passage. So you're the individual, okay? And you pay for your passage, you go, you get 50 acres. Or I can't afford to pay for my passage. I will go and I'll work it off in four to seven years. And then I'm going to get land and some tools and some seed. And I'm going to get to be able to start. This would make this work contract is called being indentured. You're an indentured servant for that period of time that was specified. Okay. So it's a different thing. So again, there are maps that you'll see about the sections for the New England colonies and the middle and the southern colonies. Just keep in mind, you need to be able to list them by their groups. Now, let's look at Massachusetts. Remember now, 
we with the middle colonies we've seen New York we've seen New Jersey we won't necessarily come back to them and as much detail that chapter one notes already covered for us but when we look at New England we go to Massachusetts uh, John Smith had left Virginia uh, and he had sailed to the north and uh, you know exploring kind of thing and he and he talks about what the land is like and people gain a new interest uh, in coming to the new world uh, and so people are planning to come. Now, some of these groups then that are going to come, like your pilgrims, Christians who are the first settlers, again, you're very familiar with, with them. You've been studying them for years. And you have the Puritans, group of Anglicans. They had wanted to purify the church, and we're going to see along the way different levels of what this really meant among the Puritans. Uh, but the Church of England wasn't changing. Uh, and getting rid of what the Puritans felt was too much like the Roman Catholic Church in them. So they decide we'll come and we'll have greater freedom to worship the way we want to in this new world. And then you have separatists. They're going to take it a step farther. They believe each local congregation needs to be independent of any other church. So they totally worship and serve God the way they want to without interference of any particular group. The Puritans aren't necessarily trying to get out of the Church of England, but because the Church of England won't change to think just like they want it to think, they're going to come and be different. The problem with the separatists was they didn't have the freedom that they needed in England, so they tried to go to Holland. And they're, they're there for about 10 years, but their kids start to speak the Dutch language. They're picking up the Dutch habits. And the people are starting to be afraid that their kids are just going to become Dutch and forget all that they wanted them to be. So their spiritual growth is threatened. The cultural heritage of the community is threatened. So they decide it's not working to be in Holland. Let's go back to England. From England, let's go to the New World. Uh, so this group of that's made up of all of these, and ultimately in there, remember, you're going to have even the group that we would simply call strangers, that that group of people who are just coming uh, for the monetary gain, the, the adventure, whatever. You know, they're not for some kind of religious reason in their background. William Bradford is leading the pilgrims. Ultimately, he's going to write a history of this, of Plymouth Plantation. This is the way he wrote the word. Uh, you'll also see it uh, written P-L-Y, M-O-U-T-H. So uh, either way will work with that particular name. Now again, here's a cutout of the Mayflower. And when you look at it, you know, goods on the bottom, people on the middle level, all together for a quite a period of time. You know, you're really not getting privacy. Uh, it's gonna be difficult and challenging uh, to travel this way. Remember that their goal had to be to reach a certain spot. They were really intending, I think, to still come and put themselves in Virginia. But they get blown off course by storms, and they end up in the Massachusetts area. As such, their charter doesn't cover them outside of what they were supposed to do. So before they get off of the, off the boat, they agree to the Mayflower Compact. They're going to say, we'll submit to the laws and elected leadership that we come up with. They weren't writing these out yet, but they were saying, we'll agree to it. So this document of self-governance, the first of its kind in America. Now, ultimately, they're going to get off. There's the struggles that they will have as well. We often, again, think in terms of Thanksgiving when the Native Americans came and helped uh, these people to survive and Thanksgiving getting its start for us as a holiday. Um, over time, you're going to see a large number of people coming. Notice the great migration from the 1630s. 50,000 settlers that are sailing from England to various colonies in America and the West Indies to uh, the New World. So a large number of people starting to come at this point. Massachusetts itself then establishes itself as a Puritan colony and elect John Winthrop as their first governor. 
he underscores the purpose of the colony to be twofold. They're going to be a Christian community in the most thorough sense of both uh, their actions and the words. Uh, Christian community, okay? Uh, describing them as being a, a city that is set upon a hill. Uh, as such, in Massachusetts, they are living by what we would call a covenant agreement. In a covenant agreement, they're agreeing with one another to pursue common goals. And this is very common to the Puritans because they believe that that's how God worked with them through a series of covenants. Now, as you go over, all the way over now, about page uh, 28, 29, now we look at uh, education. And as the colony is growing, there is a desire to make sure that young people growing up are going to be taught the Bible. So we need to train young men to be ministers. So Harvard College gets its start in 1636 for that purpose, to train men for the ministry. As Harvard will shift away from that and away from uh, a good doctrinal stance, uh, you'll see them replaced by schools like Yale and Princeton, who then also down the road will slip away as well. Uh, two factors uh, of why Massachusetts is growing and why other colonies are growing because of them, expansion and dissension are going to create this. You know, expansion, just people wanting to have something of their own, and so they move out, and they move outside of the area that the colony of Massachusetts itself is governed. And then there's also dissension, disagreement over religious practices and beliefs. In some cases, people left willingly. In some cases, as we'll see a few names, people were kicked out. So as we look at the New England colonies and look at Connecticut, being one of these examples, Thomas Hooker, a Puritan minister, 1636, he's going to move three congregations to the area of the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, so they're outside of this jur jurisdiction, so they create the fundamental orders of Connecticut. This is the first written constitution. So you have to keep that separate from Mayflower Compact, which is simply the first document of governing, which simply said they agree uh, to be governed. Fundamental Orders of Connecticut is a written constitution. It establishes a framework. It spells out how this representative self-government is going to work. What about Rhode Island? Rhode Island had Roger Williams. Roger Williams um, established a settlement called Providence. Um, he disagreed with uh, the Puritan church in the sense of uh, you had to be Puritan in order to uh, be in government and vote in government and all that. Uh, he wanted a separation of church and state. So he's going to go to Rhode Island. He's going to actually ultimately start the First Baptist Church there. Uh, Roger Williams was a little unique. He's the guy that you may have heard it before, but he's the one who said he didn't think anyone except he and his wife were Christians, and sometimes he wasn't sure about her. Uh, but that will get the start to Rhode Island. Also in Rhode Island, you're going to come across this lady, Anne Hutchinson. Uh, Anne Hutchinson uh, had been in Massachusetts, but she started having people gather in her home after the Sunday sermon, and they would discuss it, and she would critique it, and she eventually taught that outward obedience to the Scripture was unnecessary to demonstrate an inward relationship with God. It's a belief that became known as a big word, antinomianism. Um, she, and she taught that God had given her a direct revelation that superseded the Bible. So in other words, God told her that was something more important than the Bible. So ultimately, because she would not be quiet and stop doing this, she's kicked out. She's going to end up in Rhode Island. And she's going to have a brother-in-law who in 1638 is also kicked out of Massachusetts, same belief reasons, and he's going to end up helping to start the colony of New Hampshire. So then we have the middle colonies, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware here on the map. 
So looking at Pennsylvania and Delaware again, we've already seen New York, New Jersey as part of the notes for chapter one. So not as much will come out here. Pennsylvania is founded by William Penn. Uh, basically, uh, William Penn was a Quaker and the King of England ended up owing William Penn's father uh, some money in order to pay off his debt. He let William Penn go and establish a colony for the Quaker beliefs. Uh, Delaware was first settled by the Swedes. They gave us the log cabin. Remember, Delaware is going to be part of that New Jersey ins issue that ultimately uh, with New York is going to be taken from them by the English. So then the southern colonies uh, in Maryland, Cecilius Calvert, Lord Baltimore, founder and proprietor, two motives for starting this. One, obviously, to make money, commercial success, but the other was because Calvert was a Catholic, a rare Catholic that is, you know, having a good relation with the king, and the king wants to help him out. So here, go start a colony for Catholics. Now, one of the things that they did in starting this colony, though, was they gave us the Toleration Act of 1649. No one professing belief in Christ should be troubled in the free exercise of his religion. So you didn't have to be Catholic to be in Maryland. That's simply how it started. And Catholics knew they would be safe there, but other beliefs could be as well. Then in the southern colonies, think in minds of Virginia, which we've already looked at some as well, so we won't go back there. North Carolina, South Carolina. Basically, Virginia is a prosperous colony, South Carolina is a prosperous colony, and North Carolina is in the middle. Uh, those that couldn't make it income-wise uh, and get themselves really established in Virginia or South Carolina ultimately would come into North Carolina. There they learned about tobacco from the Native Americans, and it became a money crop for them in North Carolina for many years. Up until just a few decades ago, it was still a very predominant money crop. South Carolina gets more attention from uh, proprietors like Sir Anthony Ashley Cooper. Remember, South Carolina has Charleston. So the harbor at Charleston made it an ideal spot. We'll see that come to play when we get to the War for Independence. Uh, the steady source of income came with the introduction of rice cultivation in the 1690s. You, know, you have this land that gets flooded easily. Well, you take advantage of that instead of the disadvantage that it is, and you cultivate rice, and so it's going to become a nice uh, money crop for them. And then there's Georgia. Two British purposes for the colony of Georgia, because keep in mind, uh, England is claiming that land down that far south, but Florida still belongs to the Spanish. So we need a buffer zone, because South Carolina is important. We don't need the Spaniards getting to the north and bothering South Carolina. So we'll start another colony in Georgia. And well, who do we send to encourage to go to this colony? Well, let's make it for debtors and vagrants. Um, think in terms of a story like a Christmas Carol, where people that have large debts get thrown in prison until their debt's paid. But if they're in prison, how are they going to work to pay their debts? Uh, or you got just people that mild or uh, criminal element, but you don't, you're not jailing them long term or whatever, or, uh, you know, you're just, how do we relieve our population of having to take care of these individuals? We'll send them to Georgia, okay, where they can hopefully be more productive. What helped was James Oglethorpe, a refined-minded uh, minded general who determines to build a colony that's going to provide rehabilitation and opportunity, uh, or through opportunity and hard work. So the people that would come to Georgia weren't just languishing and wondering what to do. They had some leadership there that was helping them to develop into a well-established uh, colony. So you have a uh, chart like this. I'm sure it's hard to read this way. Don't worry about it too much. But, uh, you know, uh, how it was settled, what type of colony that it tended to be. And over time, uh, as the colonies would get into conflict with the king, we know during the just prior to the war, you know, the king starts to take away their rights, which then hurts them even more uh, relationship-wise. And so ultimately, you're going to see that war for independence as we get to it coming up. Don't forget to look back, if you need to, at the beginning of this one, 
to look for those uh, Chapter 2 homework assignments or look at your Google Classroom for that. Remember, if you're watching online, you have questions, email me your questions. Uh, if you happen to be watching virtually while we're doing it in class on that particular day, then you know we'll work out how to ask questions at that point. But this is a good resource for you if you're having to do this at home.